Hello and welcome to Witchy Woman Podcast. I'm your host, Danae Sweet, and this is episode 49. Today we're going to talk about frankincense and myrrh. I thought it would be a relevant topic for this time of the year. We hear about it in the Christian Bible story, but there's lots of other uses for these resins um, and in oil form. This is going to be maybe a shorter episode because I am busy as hell. I don't know why December has to be this way, but it really is. It seems like I really don't think I have a lot of things going on and then December hits and then I get overwhelmed. Like right now, I kind of feel like I'm drowning. And on top of it, we decided adding another dog or dogs to our pack would be a great idea. We tried to foster a dog from the Humane Society um, a couple weeks ago, and it just ended badly. Um, It was a three-year-old male dog. Seemed pretty cool. Seemed chill. We got him home, and long story short him and my little chihuahuas do not get along at all there was some biting (laughs) involved Um, my dogs didn't get hurt too bad but it was not a good fit so we took it back and then my husband (laughs) found some huskies online and we happened to be kind of in their area the other day because we were getting my cat neutered Dr. Dre needed to lose his manhood. So we were down there and we couldn't pick him up for like five hours. So we decided to kill some time and go look at these puppies. And when we got there, obviously not a good situation. Um, There were two four-month-old puppies and they were just crazy. I mean, I realized the huskies are like super energetic, but they would not, they didn't give a crap that we were here. They were just so happy to be in their tiny, tiny, and we're talking like five foot by three foot like puppy pin that they were in when we got there they were just crazy and they smelled oh my god they smelled worse than the dog that we got from the humane society like going in there that smelled like awful these two puppies smelled terrible and I was like where do they stay and the person that was showing him to us was the owner's son you know adult son and she said he said oh they're outside all day and and they go inside at night and bullshit they were in a their nails are like filed all the way down to the quick from digging it looks like digging on maybe cement we could get a slight glimpse of like a kennels like with cement underneath of them they didn't want to show us the mother or father um it was pretty sketchy and I really didn't want to give these people any money to further their, you know, puppy mill agenda, but they were obviously beaten. Like we walked over and if you went to pet them, they cowered and peed. They closed their eyes like they were going to get smacked. The guy that was handling them like tossed them around like they were sacks of potatoes. It was terrible. My husband really kind of wanted a lab puppy and he he was like hey we gotta go talk about it so we kind of went into the suburban and had a little chat and he was like we can't we can't we can't leave them and we can't just take one because they're obviously very codependent and we can't leave one in the shitty situation and take the other one so long story short I was trying to simplify my life (laughs) and now we have two four month old huskies a male and a female we've named them max and maya if anybody has watched that movie eight below that's where the names come from it fits them really well holy shit if there's any husky owners out there please get a hold of me and tell me what works they really have no interest in like toys at this point they chew on sticks and everything else (laughs) they kind of like chewies when they're in the house They don't have enough attention span to fetch yet. Um, We do take them on multiple walks per day. They have a big backyard to play in all day. And they come inside, you know, multiple times and kind of we're trying to teach them inside is chill time. Outside is crazy time. (laughs) Um, If anybody has any husky mom tips please send them my way because this is a whole different ball game compared to the dogs I've owned in the past I have owned we have a pit and two chihuahuas I've owned rottweilers and of course on the ranch we had cow dogs and they're pretty high high maintenance as far as energy and mental stimulation but these two dudes I know they have extra baggage because they were abused and they were in a tiny cage probably for all four months of their life so we have all kinds of other issues 
to deal with emotionally and mentally. Um, so I'm crying, trying to keep them stimulated with exercise and play and um, just letting them know that they're secure and they're safe. And they are getting better. Like, they're completely different dogs from when we got them on – what didn't we get them? We got them on Friday? Yeah, we got them on Friday. Um, so we've only had them, you know, through – three or four days, four days, five days, something like that. Um, and they're completely different. When we first picked them up, they didn't really want any attention. They didn't even acknowledge that we were there. We're like, they only had eyes for each other. They avoided us at all costs. And, um, it seems like now they're like, oh, hey, humans, what's up? And they're willing to give affection. The male is way more skittish. I'm pretty sure he got the, he either got the brunt end of the abuse or she just, compartmentalized or handled it better. I, I don't know. Either way, it was a shitty situation. I feel bad for them. So, um, so much for simpler, um, life. <laughs> we now have five freaking dogs, <laughs> three cats, and we live in like a 1200 square foot house. Our yard is way bigger than our house. Thank God. Um, but anyway, that is the state of the union at the moment. <laughs> um, we have a crazy household. So anyway, I wanted to talk about frankincense and myrrh today. And what I did was get a little bit of the history and then we'll go into the witchy uses for it. I thought that might be kind of cool. I absolutely love burning frankincense and myrrh. I, I like it better sometimes than like herbal blends because, or I add it to an herbal blend because I think the smoke is so much thicker and I really like that visual of the smoke like thick and billowing out of my little cauldron burner that I have. Um, so I wanted to share that. I don't, I don't know. There's just something special in the air when I break that out um, and do energy cleansings and I also will meditate to it. So I wanted to share this with you. So frankincense resin looks a little like tiny red pebbles. Like they call them tears, but to me they look like little yellow pebbles. Um, and they can be like darker or lighter, but generally they're, they're yellow pebbles. Um, and myrrh is a little bit darker and kind of chunkier, I guess, in texture, I, I think. Um, they are both resins that come from trees, um, and they both come from the, huh, Bursker, uh, Berser, I don't know, Berseracea, I don't freaking know, B-U-R-S-E-R-A-C-E-A-E, -E -E. I need, like, lessons in pronunciation, anyway, <laughs> so frankincense comes from the dried sap of the Botswellia tree, and myrrh comes from the dried sap, or the, of the Coma for a tree. Coma for a tree? Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> to get sap, they basically like wound the tree, like make a cut or something in it, and the tree will try to heal itself by sending the sap or the gum to the wound in the tree. And I read that there's a there's a fine line between making enough damage to get the sap and keeping the tree healthy and causing too much damage and hurting the health of the tree when you harvest it. So the workers that harvest the saps have really developed a feel for it and they really know how far they can go before they hurt the tree. Um, and obviously if you, it will damage their bottom line if they damage the trees too much. So they're very conscious of it. Um, so after it's harvested, it may be used, um, in its dried form or steamed to yield essential oils. Both are edible and can be chewed like gum. Um, they're super fragrant, like very fragrant, especially when you burn them. Um, frankincense gives off kind of a sweet citrusy scent and myrrh produces more of a piney, like woodsier odor. So when you think of these resins, most of us go straight to the Bible references during Christmas time. Um, their story goes that the wise man or the magi followed the star of Bethlehem and delivered gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But they really do have much deeper roots that reach outside the few passages in the Christian Bible. Around 3,500 years ago, the Pharaoh had... Hmm, it's another one. I'm terrible. I Just call me the queen of like mispronunciations. The Pharaoh Hatshepsut, Hatshepsut, oh, fuck. Anyway, <laughs> secured her empire's first myrrh tree. She was this badass Egyptian pharaoh queen and had tons of accomplishments during her time as rule. But um, the the resin war was kind of what she was known for during her time. So 
She ruled Egypt for roughly two decades until her death around 480 BC. She was, basically the, the story goes, she was tired of paying super high prices for the resins, for especially for myrrh. And she sent her sneaky spies to get trees so that she could have her own sources of both frankincense and myrrh. Um, and she was fine with either stealing the trees if it didn't work or conquering the lands where they grew. So basically if her spies brought these trees back and they couldn't grow them and they couldn't, wouldn't, they couldn't cultivate it, then they were cool with just going to the place where they grew and, and taking, taking the land so they could have control over the frankincense and myrrh. So when I was reading, reading a about all this stuff it was like resin wars it was like the oil wars of more modern times um and it was so important to her that sacks of frankincense and and uh, potted saplings of myrrh producing trees are are drawn or appear on all the mur- murals decorating her temple and there's a there's a big temple called temple dedicated to her as queen i thought it was kind of neat so it was a very important commodity at the time and um, I was doing a little research about about the resin, the resins, and um, there's an expert in these resins named Douglas Daly, and she, he's a curi- curator of the New York Botanical Gardens, and he said he found references to these resins all around the world in different cultures that would have zero contact with each other, and they all use the resins for very similar purposes. So I found that so cool. I I remember when we did the episode on smoke clearing, I had kind of the similar things. Like all around the world, people use different um, methods of of smoke clearing, but it was very similar. And even cultures that didn't have any contact with each other still did the same thing. Like I just found that amazing. Um. Anyway, I'm getting off track. <laughs> Anyway, um, so commonly used, there's there's common uses such as incense, perfume, and embalming fluid um, that I found. And they're also used in different cultures to cleanse energy and to ward off evil spirits. Um, and the resins aren't exclusive to Egyptian history. So as I said, we found them all over. Frankincense has been a staple traditional Chinese medicine since at least 500 BC. Frankincense and myrrh have been traded in the Middle East and North Africa for about 5,000 years. Holy crap. Um, it's believed that the Babylonians and the Assyrians burned them during re- religious ceremonies. Um, also, ancient Egyptians bought entire boatloads of the resins from the Phoenicians, using them in incense, insect repellent, perfume, uh, salves for wounds and sores, and they were also ingredients in the embalming process. Um, I thought this was kind of cool. Myrrh oil served as like a facial treatment for Egyptian people, while frankincense was charred and ground into a powder uh, to make like that the eyeliner that you see in all of the artwork and drawings and everything of Egyptian uh, women wore. I I just thought that was really, really cool that it had way different uses other than the medicinal or the spiritual uses. It was like practical. You can use it on your face and on your eyes (laughs) for makeup. Also, um, so wanting the, the Romans really liked that they, they bought a lot of it and they really wanted to get into the frankincense trade. So they sent 10,000 troops to the land of frankincense in the first century BC to conquer and control the production of these resins. Um, But the Romans actually never arrived and were driven back by the heat and the conditions in the desert. They just were not used to that and they just couldn't couldn't get her done (laughs) so the romans and greeks also imported a lot of both of these resins to use as incense and during cremations so even even the romans and the greek had very very um important uses for these two these two resins they also recognized the medicinal properties and they used them for antiseptics anti-inflammatories and for their analgesic properties they also used them from for indigestion, chronic coughs, hemorrhoids, and bad breath. So they actually would chew the gum. The resin trade had really created a, a money flow, big money flow, and made the Southern Arabians one of the richest cultures in the, on earth at that particular time. But 
here comes Christianity in Europe. <laughs> and when the Roman Empire fell, it actually created a decline in the use of the resins because early Christians associated these resins with paganism and they were actually prohibited, which resulted in the failing trade routes that literally had been thriving for centuries. Um, and kind of fast forward through uh, Christian uh, evolution. And later on, the Catholics actually adopted the use of both of these resins, though. And they still use them in, cert uh, in rituals and ceremonies today. So, mm, hypocrites much? Yas. Even today, we use frankincense and myrrh for all kinds of reasons. Um, there has been... As most of you know, I'm sure, there's been a rise in alternative medicine and the popular, bleh, popularity of it. <laughs> um, that has really boosted the use and um, the purchasing of frankincense and myrrh. Um, both of them are used in traditional um, Chinese medicine and in aromatherapy and other natural medicines. Um they're also used in natural toothpaste. So myrrh is a common ingredient in natural toothpaste. And I had no idea. I don't know how I feel about having that earthy, woodsy, piney taste in my mouth. Like I hate pine nuts. I do not like them. I don't know why I don't like to eat them. I just, <laughs> the taste is too strong. So to me, I'm like myrrh tastes or smells piney or woodsy. So having that in my mouth sounds, bleh, sounds gross. And if anybody actually uses it, um, let me know. Does it taste good? Does it taste terrible? Cause I would, I would really be open to trying these kind of things. I just, I think of the taste or the smell of it and go, the taste of that has to be terrible. <laughs> anyway, I'm getting off track again. So um, there's actually a lot of research that's been done about the effectiveness of myrrh and frankincense in different applications. Um, one of those, there was a 1996 paper reported that myrrh blunts the pain in mice. And while uh, there was one in 2009, studies suggested that it might help lower cholesterol. Frankincense has also been investigated as a possible treatment for some cancers. Um, ul hmm, ulcerative, colster ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, anxiety, and asthma, among a list of other conditions as well. So it's actually gaining a little traction in the modern uh, medicinal field. I want to talk about frankincense and myrrh in witchcraft. I actually use... Uh, it a lot. I use frankincense probably the most. I use it in my essential oil blends because it's, I think it's super useful. I use it in resin form and essential oil form. Um, and medicinally, I use it for my anxiety. Um, I use it like in a rotter, a roller bottle on the bottoms of my feet like a couple times a day. And if it's a bad, bad day, I use it on my wrists as well. And I blend frankincense with other calming and grounding essential oils to make a blend that helps me kind of like derail a panic attack and ease my anxiety. And seriously, during this time of year, I use a shitload of it <laughs> because for me, December is always a shit show. My life is a shit show on a normal basis, but like December, it cranks it up a notch. Um, I'm actually an introvert by nature. Go, It sounds weird. I have a podcast and I do this kind of thing, but I'm actually an introvert. Um, so going to family gatherings and all that crap really freaks the crap out of me. Um, so I will use that, you know, morning and night on my feet. And then I take a little roller bottle with me to any kind of event or function. I shove it in my pocket or my purse or whatever. And I just, well, sometimes I'll just take it out and smell it or I'll put it on my wrist so that I can kind of bring my hand to my face and, and smell it as well. Um, I know this is going to get a lot of shit from people who say you shouldn't do this. And I am not, I'm going to preface this. I am not advocating ingesting essential oils at all. This is just what I do. So I'm saying there are negative effects for ingesting essential oils especially if they have shitty um, ingredients, if they're not actually pure. So don't ingest it. Don't do what I do. But if I have a panic attack, I actually will put a couple drops of frankincense on my tongue as well as copaiba oil um, and sometimes lavender. I know we're not supposed to eat that stuff. It's bad. I don't mix it. I just put it directly on my tongue if I'm having like in the middle or if I feel myself starting to have a, a panic attack and I have those oils 
like if I'm in the house and this is happening, I'll run over to my oil stash and stick that on my tongue, take a couple breaths. And I'm not kidding. I can just feel, I can feel that like emotion and the energy kind of melt off of me. So again, don't do what I do. It's bad. You could have serious uh, negative effects from ingesting oils. My natural path cringes when she hears that I actually ingest them. She hates that I do that. <laughs> She's fine with me putting them on my body as long as I have a carrier oil, but she really poo-poos uh, putting them in my mouth. So anyway, <laughs> um, let's go into what frankincense can be used for in your witchcraft pack practice. So it's commonly used for purification, spirituality, relaxation, focus, um, love, abundance, and luck. Uh, what else? Oh, protection, consecration. So like if you're consecrating new tools, you can use this oil um, and also adds potency. So if you want a little level up or a little punch to your spells, add uh, the use of the of frankincense. Um, it's also used when you want to meditate for enlightenment, uh, inspiration, or introspection. So if you diffuse it while you, the oil while you uh, meditate, you can use it on your skin or use it as a resin. Um, the ruling planet for frankincense is sun. The element is fire and the gender is masculine. And some believe that frankincense is the most powerful and useful incense for basically getting out any shitty energy in your space the 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 line where i read this was fumigating sacred space in preparation of any ritual i'll post all the links that i get all my information from too if you want to read through it um it says that it purifies and raises the energy of the ritual space so i think that's very true when i use frankincense it just feels sacred in my space it feels clean energetically um so i highly recommend using the resin or the oil it's um burned as an offering to the sun god ra in ancient egypt and on a daily basis at sunrise i thought that was kind of neat it's suitable as an offering to all sun gods it can enhance your psychic ability so burn incense to like open that third eye chakra or anoint the third eye with a little bit of frankincense oil it can be added to anointing oils for uh, rites of passage rituals. So think like initiations or your wickenings, things like that. Um, it's also associated with good fortune in business. So if you carry a few bits of resin in your pocket when you go to a business meeting or interview, that's supposed to bring, bring good luck in your business. All right, so let's go on to myrrh. I use myrrh in both resin and oil forms as well, and I, and I do. I combine it with frankincense often. I don't use it as much as frankincense. I've just, I had started using it in resin form and just recently got some, uh, some essential oil to use, and I really do like it. Um, I really get that earthy, deep fragrant, fragrance from it, and I, and I love the smell. It's not near as sweet as frankincense, and it pairs really well with it because of that. They both have a completely different note fragrance-wise. Um, anyway, I use it uh, in purification oils. I've used it in some soaps and some um, bath, bath salts and things like that um, with frankincense and some other stuff for like purification and cleansing the aura or, or your energy. Um, it's often used for protection, purification, healing. It represents the crone, um, represents underworld, it gives you courage and I found it in a lot of sources as be, to be used during exorcisms. So that might be where the Catholic Church kind of comes in. I don't know. The ruling planet is uh, Mars and the sun. The element is water. Gender is feminine for this one. So it makes sense that they go together so nicely. The, uh, um, it is a great offering for Ra, Isis, Adonis, um, Poseidon, Neptune, um, and what did I, oh, I had, uh, did I name, oh, Protagonus, whatever that is, never heard of that one. Um, myrrh oil and incense is used, used, is used in aromatherapy for respiratory and digestive health. Um, it, and it also is that calming oil. So it's going to bring about that sense of tranquility and calmness. Um, the fragrance can help cope with loss helps heals the body and mind it's very mind body spirit oil um and and resin and it i thought this was kind of neat it was 
It is good for the spirit after devastation. So if you have felt destroyed, if you've been broken down by whatever, um, this oil is supposed to help heal you mind, body, and spirit. So you could use it on your body, you could diffuse it, and you could use it in resin form um, while meditating and focusing on healing and releasing all that pain. I think that's a really beautiful use for it. So that is all I have on frankincense and myrrh. There was a shitload of information. I'm going to post all of the links in the show notes so that you can read all about it. Um, There was just a plethora of information. I wanted to kind of give you the highlights. I didn't want to go super, super deep um, because I could have had like a two-hour episode when it comes to frankincense and myrrh and like the history and all the cool stuff. But these are the highlights. I definitely use both of these, both of these resins a lot. I love it. If you have not tried a resin yet, try frankincense and myrrh and burn them together like on a charcoal disc. It smells so good. It will feel pre-prepared. There's a lot more smoke when it comes to to resins, in my opinion, than when burning any kind of um, herb or anything like a powder. This really billows up nicely and it's got a constant like I don't know, the consistency of the of the flow of the smoke really is something that I enjoy. So if you haven't tried it, go out and get you some. Most metaphysical places will have it. You can get it off of Amazon, I'm sure, but I like to, to shop local. So um, check out your local metaphysical store. Um, and if you can't find it, let me know and I will see if I can find some for you from a reputable, reputable <laughs> metaphysical spiritual shop. I wanted to give a shout out to the new Patreon members. Um, I cannot remember how far I went back last time. So I'm going to do December. So the new ones in December are Diana T, Rebecca M, Jenna J, Ali R, and Taryn A. Thank you guys so much for supporting the podcast. I love all of you. I I love all my listeners. I love all the Patreon sub- subscribers. It's just surreal for me. Um when I think about the podcast and people actually listening to me for one (laughs) and also supporting me and I appreciate it. This has turned into kind of like a part-time job for me where it actually pays for itself and it's paying some of my bills and not being very gainfully employed. (laughs) It really, really helps. Um, I, I appreciate that seriously so much. Like, like this week's, they're this month's water bill paid for by Patreon subscribers. So thank you so much for keeping our water on. And if you would like to subscribe or become a Patreon supporter, go to patreon.com slash witchy woman podcast. And there you can choose any of the tiers and that gets you into our WW Coven. That's a Facebook group that's closed and private online. And that's where we do rituals, learn about spell work. Um, I do card pulls there and live videos. If any of the episodes have a video component to it, that is where it will be posted is in that group. So if you want to have more content, that's where you go. The show the show notes always has the link for the WW Coven membership in there. Um, and I want to, to give a shout out to my sponsors for those. I have sponsors for the levels of um, sponsorships or how do I even say that? Levels, the tears. That's what I want to say. Man, I have not eaten breakfast. I had a buttload of coffee and that's it. So excuse m- my lack of verbal skills today. I'm also stressed. <laughs> anyway, so uh, the citrine level is the top tier. And in that level is sponsored by Earth Mama Creations and Holistic Healing Therapeutics. They are both amazing uh, companies owned by women, um, and they are beautiful souls. Uh, Rena Dwelly is the uh, person in charge of a holistic healing therapeutics. She is a healer, amazing creator of magical products. Um, Crystal Gade is the owner of uh, Earth Mama Creations and she creates sprays, candles, jewelry, amazing uh, metaphysical products as well. And in that sponsorship level, those two companies send you a gift quarterly. Um, The next one down would be the Amethyst and that is sponsored by Shelly Leggett of Lavender Potions. She is a psychic medium, a healer, and a beautiful soul as well. She is sponsoring that by giving um, both levels, Citrine and Amethyst, the 
readings every quarter. So uh, if you join those levels, you'll get access to the WW Coven reading group, and she will do readings through that group for you. So that is a buttload of stuff. And the bottom tier is the it's just a dollar. And that gets you into the WW Coven. So if you would like any more information about that and you can't find it in my show notes or you just can't find where the hell to go, just get a hold of me. Um, you can email me at witchywomanpodcast at gmail.com. I am on Instagram at witchywomanpodcast. I'm on Twitter, uh, Danae underscore sweet underscore. And as always, you can go to uh, witchywomanpodcast.com and that is where you can listen to the podcast, read my blog, you can read up on our sponsors. I'm not doing services at the moment but you can read about what I did offer. I'm just taking a little break. I'm frazzled and fried and I, I just need a little spiritual break for myself. So head over there, uh, give me some traffic. Um, I also have a P.O. Box, P.O. Box 333, Hyannis, Nebraska 69350. I wish you could hear, it's not going to pick up on the mic, but my cat is like in a chair not too far from here, like snoring, sawing logs. I really wish I could be her right now because I'm tired. (laughs) Anyway, I hope everybody, if you celebrate Christmas, have a beautiful Christmas Eve and have a beautiful Christmas tomorrow. Whatever you celebrate, just have have a good time. (laughs) Try to release some of the anxiety like I'm going to try to do um, and enjoy and enjoy the season. Um, I know it's going to be kind of chilly here, but we're going to still get out and uh, walk the dogs and try to just enjoy the day. So anyway, I guess that's all I have. So as always, stay witchy. Bye-bye.